All right, everyone, live from our respective locations, I'm MOCA DSV's Public Information Associate, Megan Owens, and this is Momentum, a live stream event produced by your coalition connecting advocates across our state. So welcome everyone. This event is being recorded and will be shared out on YouTube um, as well as our podcast platforms so that anyone who wasn't able to attend the live event can still have an opportunity to watch or listen to all of our Momentum Lives. Each of them take place on the last Friday of the month at 12 p.m. Central. Um, so check all those out and check out next month as well. So tomorrow marks the beginning of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And this year, Missouri, um, in Missouri, at MOCA DSV, we decided to do a huge volunteer engagement campaign. Uh, and part of that was to help programs recruit more volunteers here in Missouri, especially hospital advocates. And part of that had to do with um, the expected increase because of the sexual assault telehealth network um, for, nurse, for nurse examinations, for forensic exams, that is going to be starting up next year. And there's going to be a huge increased need for volunteers because of that. The other piece is that the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights is also now in place. And so with that Survivor Bill of Rights, there's lots of rights that survivors get, but one of them is the right to have an advocate if they choose to. And so we're expecting there to be an increase in volunteers. And so because of that, we wanted to make our March Momentum also be about volunteer engagement. And so we decided to ask a couple of folks from our programs to join us today to talk about their volunteer programs, um, how they do volunteer engagement and things like that. So today's guests are Sarah Cooper from Moxa and Jessica Hill from Safe House of Southeast Missouri. Welcome both of you. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. So happy to be here. Super excited to have both of you on. Jessica has been on before. She was on in January. Folks saw that one, but she's also been on in the past before I was the host. And Sarah, is her, this is her first time on it. So we're so excited to have them on. Um, really great to, that you all are both able to join us today. Um, so for folks joining the live, feel free to ask any questions or share any comments. There is a short delay between the Zoom and Facebook Live, and we do have coalition staff who are helping to moderate the live, so feel free to ask any questions. Um, but if you don't get questions, your questions answered or you think of things later, we will check the Facebook comments afterwards. You also can reach out to us anytime, and we're happy to answer any questions. So just kind of jumping right in with both of you, I'd love to hear a little bit about who each of you are for anyone who hasn't heard of you before and what your roles are at your agency. I'm Jessica Hill, and I'm the executive director of the Safe House of Southeast Missouri in Cape Girardeau. And I've been uh, with the Safe House for this is my 10th year. And we have um, an emergency shelter, a outreach office, and a thrift store. And we're going to be talking about volunteers for all of those today. How about you, awesome. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Cooper. I'm the coordinator of volunteer services at MOXA. Been at MOXA for two years and a volunteer coordinator for five, five years now. Um, and MOXA is the Metropolitan Organization to Counter Sexual Assault. And we serve both Kansas and Missouri, six counties within the metropolitan area. Awesome. Thank you both of you so much. So you kind of already alluded to a little bit about this, but I'd love to know kind of how you got connected with doing volunteer work. Um, I know Sarah, you mentioned that was been doing it for five years. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of what drew you into that part of the work. And then for Jessica, for you, how that volunteer work has kind of played into your roles. Sure. So I came to the world of volunteerism from a bit of a roundabout way. I actually got my degree in directing theater for social change. Um, and I have always loved connecting people to a mission. Mm -hmm. And so I did theater professionally for a little while. I loved it, but I wasn't finding that the work I was doing was really making the impact that I wanted it to do. So I um, started managing volunteers from theaters, volunteers that do ticketing, volunteers that help find people's seats. Um, and that eventually translated to me working as the volunteer coordinator at the Kansas City Zoo. And then I did that up until the pandemic. And then I worked with the COVID disaster response team at Heart to Heart International, and then eventually here at MOXA. And it's very interesting because uh, I like to say that I've been in love with MOXA for a very long time. When I was first starting to go to college, I was looking at two different routes. Did I want to become a theater professional and go that route? Or did I want to become a social worker so that I could eventually work at MOXA? So it turns out you really can have <laughs> the best of both worlds. And this is really, in a lot of ways, my dream job. So super thrilled to be here. That's fantastic. I love this is the different ways that we end up in this work. And I think it's uh, amazing that you were like thinking about this organization and now you kind of made that happen. And now you're working at Mox. So that's amazing. Yeah. Jessica, how about you? Well, I uh, first started working with volunteers um, 
several years ago, I lived in Tulsa, worked for the city of Tulsa, and they had a volunteer program um, that I began working with. And I think anybody who works in the nonprofit realm, volunteers are such a vital part of all of our work that um, as I've gone from, you know, very, to various agencies, there's always been a volunteer component. And so here at the Safe House, um, we are a very uh, lean organization. And so one of the hats that we um, that several of us wear is is coordination with volunteers. And uh, for us, we have um, actually a very large cadre of volunteers who work in our thrift store. And the only um, paid staff that we have are the cashiers and our manager. Everyone else is a volunteer. And so we get to work with them on a daily basis. And then we also have volunteers in our shelter. And then we have quite a few volunteers who help us with um, fundraising and those types of things as well. Fantastic. Well, just to kind of got the ball, ball rolling with my next question. It's like you read my mind. Um, what types of positions and roles do you have for volunteers? And Jessica, you just mentioned a few. Do you mind expanding a little bit on what that might look like? Yeah. So um, I know not every agency has a thrift store, although you should consider having one. They're great. But um, we have, as I mentioned, we have volunteers for that, some of whom are practically full-time employees. Most of them are retired um, and so, you know, this is like a like a second home for them, and they even have specialized roles within the thrift store to focus on different types of merchandise and and roles that we have there. Um, we have one lady who everything that comes in that's like a Christmas decoration, she is in charge of that and gets it all ready for our Christmas bazaar that we have at the in November and just certain things like that. Um, they really take a lot of ownership over that and a lot of pride. Um, in the organization. And so we love, we love our thrift store volunteers. Um, we do have um, a, a small shelter volunteer program. Um, and I think maybe some other organizations may have larger ones. Ours is primarily um, through Southeast Missouri State University here in Cape. And so we do have interns, especially social work interns, who again, are practically like full-time employees. They're with us for full days a week um, for a whole semester. And we have other interns as well. And then we also have um, college volunteers who come and help us, especially with things like childcare. Um, and we go through the, the training process with them. Um, and so, um, and then we have um, this wonderful group of, volunteers who um, do fundraising for us. And so we have a pretty large fundraiser every fall called Vintage Now. It's a fashion show. And uh, this is our 14th year um, for it. And so the the coordinator of it is a volunteer and everyone who works on it, there's like two, myself and one other staff member are the only staff support. All the rest of it is done by volunteers. And last year after expenses, we raised $155,000. So that mm. group of volunteers is a force. And, um, and we were so grateful for them because we really couldn't do that um, without them. It sounds phenomenal. And I want to go to both of those events. A Christmas bazaar sounds so great. And I, oh, it's amazing. The Christmas bazaar is so fun. Really? Yeah. It sounds amazing. Like just, I hear the word bazaar and I'm immediately interested, but yeah. it being Christmas, like those are always the best ones. Mm -hmm. And I also love vintage clothes. So that sounds like two amazing events. Um, and it's so cool that the vintage now one is run so much by volunteers who kind of made that whole thing happen and it being such right. a big fundraiser for you all. That's fantastic. Yep. They're, they're great. What about you, Sarah? Yeah, absolutely. I'm also going to be making a trip to that thrift store. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> um, so our Moxa volunteers, we have a lot going on. We have five programs under the volunteer program umbrella. So we have hospital advocacy, crisis line, education, our speakers bureau volunteers, and, and community outreach. And to kind of get a little bit more into those various programs, our number one need and the most volunteers that we have fall within our hospital advocacy program. Those are folks that are going to hospitals and supporting survivors as they do their forensic sexual uh, exams. So hospital advocates, they provide emotional support, crisis intervention and problem solving to assist survivors on the first step of healing. Um, we also know that when a survivor has an advocate in the room, the chances for a long-term healing plan are significantly increased. 
Our crisis line volunteers, those are folks that help callers on our 24 hour crisis line. They navigate questions and concerns while offering resources and support. Um, and I kind of like to tell people and break down the stereotypes of a crisis line. It's not a call center. These are volunteers that are doing this from the comfort of their own homes on the couch, you know? Uh, so it's really a, a kind of unique and different crisis line. Um, and then we also have our education volunteers. We have an early childhood consent education program called Project Aware. So those volunteers go into the schools and teach kiddos from K through fifth grade about the basics of body consent, safe adults, um, and safety skills. So those are are really fantastic programs. And then we also have great volunteers that do Speakers Bureau and Community Outreach. Those are survivors and uh, family members alike that go and share about our services, table at events, connect with community partners, and then spread the message of what MOXA is trying to do. Fantastic. I just love hearing about the, all the different opportunities that both of your organizations have. I really feel like it's hitting the broad spectrum of all the different roles that volunteers can play. I don't know about you all, but I got started in this work as an intern. So like I kind of stumbled into it and now I'm in it. So this is what happens when you volunteer or an intern at a domestic and sexual violence agency. You just end up falling in love with it and it becomes your life work. Um, so this is just to help kind of folks thinking about maybe interested in volunteering or how do I kind of get involved with different agencies? How do you all typically do your recruitment for volunteers? Sure. I'm happy to take that first. So like a lot of other programs, we were deeply affected during COVID, um, particularly because the majority of our volunteers are hospital advocates, and that became very, very hard. So when I came on in 2021, my position was really to retain the volunteers that we currently had, which I know we're going to talk more about. And then then once the boat was fully, you know, sailing, then start to bring more people onto it. So in terms of recruitment, we work with a lot of different community partners. We do tabling events. Um, we're out there on the web <laughs> trying to recruit wherever we can. But honestly, we're trying to do more ground level work. We're trying to go into social work programs and to the different schools that might have a, a good career pipeline to doing this work so we can go in and talk about what we're doing at MOXA. Um, we also have a wonderful prevention team that has different coalitions that have uh, great opportunities for us to talk um, at school groups, at churches, at community levels, and get more people involved in this work. I think it is intimidating, right? When you think about hospital advocacy, when you think about the crisis line. So a big goal for me is to kind of break down uh, the anxiety of volunteering and really stress that it's something that anybody can do, any skill level, any experience. Um, but I also think one of the most incredible things about this particular program is that a lot of the volunteers that find us are survivors themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and that's common with other agencies like ours. Um, but truly it is really incredible that people utilize volunteering as a part of their healing process and that they can go in and be that person that somebody was for them before. Uh, so that's really special. And one of my favorite things about our program. It's fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. How about you, Jessica? So we, for our um, thrift shop volunteers, we work with our local volunteer center. So we're, we are listed with them and have received several um, referrals from them. So somebody who is interested in volunteering, not exactly sure how to plug in or where they can go, and then they are able to um, see us as an option that they think they would be interested in. Then we also work with our local United Way. We are a local um, United Way funded partner. And so they also have a monthly newsletter and um, are and will list your volunteer opportunities. And we've gotten volunteers through them as well. And then actually it's kind of similar um, to recruiting from your client base to help with advocacy. We recruit from our thrift store shoppers. Uh, and you know, we know people who love the thrift store and when they find out that they have the opportunity not only to shop there, but also to help um, volunteering, we've had several volunteers who, who came um, that way as well. So it's, we also experienced um, a drop off in volunteering during COVID. Um, our thrift store actually had to be closed for about eight weeks um, at the very beginning of COVID when everything was being shut down. And so um, 
as a result of that. And then also just, you know, the age of our volunteers is a little older, more retirees and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, there, there was definitely concern about being out in and uh, coming in to volunteer. And so we're, we're building that back up. Many people came back and, uh, and we have some new volunteers as well. Um, the other thing that um, that, that we do is we encourage like businesses to come in on a Saturday and do a, a community give back type day and uh, and civic organizations as well, like the local Zonta Club has come on a Saturday and and just help for the day. There's always something to do. And so the commitment level there is, you know, one day makes an impact. You can't always say that in every volunteer opportunity. And so we've had people who came in with their workplace or with a civic organization or something, loved their experience and wanted to continue on. So um, those things have all been really good for us. Um, on the side of the um, of our fundraising group, I will say that is a very much of a networking type of, of group. And so uh, the people who have been involved with that, a lot of them actually started out as models in the fashion show. We have 60 models. They're all volunteers um, from our community, all, um, you know, every demographic represented. They're all ladies, but otherwise, you know, every age and, and that sort of thing. Anyway, and some of them, they'll, they'll model for two or three years. And then they're like, you know, I think I'm probably, you know, I've done that. And but they still want to be part of it and help. And so they come onto our planning committee and they already have the experience of knowing what the event is like. And so we have several volunteers um, through that group who um, who got involved first, you know, at, at some level at the show and then and they got involved with the planning. That's fantastic. I just love hearing about the the ways that people kind of get initially plugged in, whether it's I just need somewhere to volunteer and they happen to call you on and kind of fall in love with it or getting connected in a different way and getting really drawn into the work. I think that just really speaks to the nature of y'all's organizations and also this work that it really people, once they're in it, they really want to continue. To yeah, be I, you're exactly right. And I think the more exposure we can give to people and to our community about the work that we do and the different kinds of ways that they can plug in they do really um, understand the mission and then really want to be part of it in, in whatever way, you know, their, their skill set would lend to. And so the other resource, of course, for us is our local university. And um, there is a, um, a sorority called Alpha Chi Omega. And at the national level, their philanthropy is domestic violence. So I highly encourage anyone who would have a local Alpha Chi Omega chapter to get involved um, with them. But um, they do a lot of volunteer work for us. And as I mentioned, um, they come over and do child care. It's more like, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a, like a, a, an hour or two of like respite really for parents. And so they don't, they, they the parent has to stay, you know, on uh, at our shelter but you know they can go up to their room or take a shower or do laundry whatever and know that their kids are you know are playing games and doing things like that with our volunteers and that works out really well that's so fantastic like that's a really needed needed thing in general in this space is child care but even having an opportunity to have like if you're a working parent who's been struggling and you're in the shelter getting one hour to yourself of time yes. is like it means a huge difference. Yeah. yeah it does so that's fantastic um, kind of going back to what Sarah had mentioned, um, I mean, you mentioned that you have a lot of survivors who also participate in your volunteer program. And I know that probably a lot of programs have similar things. And I would just love to hear about um, how both of you, um, how you help survivors who are coming in, who really want to be part of this work, balance that aspect of coming into this work and potentially being exposed to things that might re-trigger them, um, while also wanting to help them be a part of what, be a part of whatever healing thing that is really important to them. Sure. Well, at Moxo, we don't set any limits on healing. So people don't have to be like a year out from trauma or anything like that. They can join whenever. And honestly, we treat them like every other volunteer that's coming in to do this work. We really put the power towards them to be stewards of their own self-care and trauma stewardship. But we also provide them with the tools that we provide all the other volunteers that we have. Um, <clears throat> our work is a bit unique because Unlike group volunteering, unlike being at a thrift store together, which does sound like a lot of fun, our volunteers are mostly solitary volunteers. They're individual volunteers. So they are on call, they're at their own homes. If they're doing project aware education, they're solo doing that. So really we have to have a culture in our volunteer program of communication and support um, so that they know that they're never alone doing the work. So there's a lot of different things that are a part of that. Um, 
but mostly we have a really fantastic culture of debriefing and on-call staff support. So if somebody is volunteering, they can always call us or text us with questions. We always do checkouts and check-ins. And then our job as the volunteer team is to make sure that we're tracking where people have been. Do they need extra support? Do they need help? So keeping those lines of communication open. The other thing that I want to mention with that is we do self-care as a part of our training, um, and I could talk for years about our training program. Uh, we really try to empower people from the start to identify what is potentially traumatic to them and then choose the best courses of action. So all of our roles, there's not a lot of pressure to do. You have to volunteer, you know, this many hours or we're going to sign you up for this schedule. People get to choose. They have... The, the flexibility of scheduling, they have the flexibility of saying, no, I can't go on any more activations during the shift. And our volunteers can choose which roles they want to do. So we train everybody with a basics of hospital advocacy, but then people can pick and choose what roles would work best for them. They can do hospital advocacy and speakers bureau or crisis line and project aware. So really people have the power to change if they're realizing that doing hospital advocacy is bringing a lot of stuff back up, I might need to take a step back. So we're always there to support them and validate whatever choices they need to make in their volunteer journey, because we do want it to be fun and fulfilling for everyone. It's fantastic. I just love this. And then you said that we don't put limits on healing. I just, I was like, oh yes, say it again. I love that so much. I think it's something that I think is so important. And we see that from talking to all the different programs, even on, on this specific like podcast and webcast is just seeing how these different threads through all of the programs across Missouri in different areas have a lot of the same themes. And one of those themes is, you know, working with survivors, what their, what their healing might look like and be able to be a part of a volunteer program without having to meet certain requirements or restrictions. That's such an important part of that. I love, love that you said that. It just made my heart warm. Jessica, what about you all? Well, we, we do have the um, one year removed from services um, policy, but we actually, it used to be longer than that. And we shortened it so mm -hmm. that we could get clients involved in volunteering more quickly than they had been able to in the past. Um, and I actually did this. I was so interested in, in this and trying to figure out the best way to do it. Like I sent out a message on base camp at one point last year and asked, you know, for people, what is your policy on this? Just to try to gauge, you know, where we fall and, and if we're doing the right things there. I think that's something we can all be sort of evaluating and thinking about is how quickly you can move someone from services to, um, <clears throat> to volunteering. But um, yeah, I think we, um, we do have clients who are involved, especially as co-facilitators in our support groups. Um, and so we have a counselor who will who will lead our support groups, but then she has one or two survivors who um, help as co-facilitators, and that works really well. And, you know, we kind of look at it similar to the um, substance um, use recovery process where they have what they call peer support specialists, but it's that same concept of someone who has been through this, then they've been through um, a, a program of assistance, and now they want to help other people. And um, I think it really, when they go through our training and, you know, the, that 48 hours and, and they learn sort of the professional approaches to helping, it, it kind of, you know, flips the switch a little bit and they really begin to take ownership of that <clears throat> and feel like, yes, I'm in a new role now and, you know, and I'm here to assist others. And then, yes, absolutely. If something, you know, comes back up or feel like they need some extra support, then we're able to provide that to them and definitely want to be able to do that. Sounds fantastic. I, I love that you all have that survivor support who were in those groups as well. That's such an important piece. Um, having someone who totally understands your experience and the person who's a mental health professional, that just, I'm sure means so much to survivors who can feel really safe sharing in those spaces. Yes. Makes me and think about people. Oh, yeah. To yeah. see people who have been through the whole process, yeah. and, you know, it's very encouraging, especially for folks brand new, you know, in their first few yeah. weeks with the support group that, you know, like there's, there's folks there who understand um, completely what they've been through and, and, you know, have, have that perspective as well. And I've seen them in a, a new space in their life of like, I can, this isn't going to be the rest of my life feeling the way that I'm feeling right now. Like I can see an example of someone who experienced similar things to me, who is able to be in a different place in their life. 
that must just be really meaningful to so many folks. Um, and I, this is a side anecdote, but I, whenever I worked at my first program, I worked at, I was a college student and I was, you know, doing my intern thing. And one of the uh, servers came in and was like, can I speak to someone older? Like who knows anything about this? And I just left and I was like, there's, it probably means so much more to you in this moment to speak to somebody who has more experience um, and who's had the same experiences you have, because you don't know me and you don't know this experience to so what that means to have someone who has a survivor experience who can be in this space and help other survivors is such an important thing. Um, and I just love so much that that's a, a thing that you all do at Safe House. It's fantastic. So I know Sarah kind of mentioned training a little bit, but I wanted to jump into what does training look like for, for both of your programs? Jessica, do you want to start out? Yeah, so we do adhere to the, the 48 hour standard for a DVSC program. And I will say sometimes, you know, you have a volunteer and they're like, I'd like to volunteer. And they think that they're just going to go to the shelter and start changing lives tomorrow, you know, and like, well, actually, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a few steps before that. And which I think is actually very good because then you really see people um, and have their commitment, you know, and they, they understand what, you know, what they're doing, what the, what they have actually signed up to do. And so um, for us, we do utilize the coalition's um, web-based um, training, especially for things like confidentiality and um, some of those, you know, foundational advocacy um topics that we want to be sure every volunteer is aware of. And then um, we do some sort of classroom style uh, training. A lot of that is one-on-one, -on -one, not only with, for instance, our shelter director, but also some of our really seasoned um, em other employees. Um, we have a couple of, of employees who've been with us for um, over 25 years, both of them. And they, you know, they, they know how to handle a hotline call like nobody else and those kinds of things. And so it's great to hear from a variety of voices, I think, in terms of that. And then, um, and then we do quite a bit of, of observation, shadowing, um, you know, just being there and seeing the flow of, of how things go. Um, and then for our thrift store volunteers, because they, don't have client interaction there that's there's that standard you know of, of that time is not there it's much more for them about um we do do a um a basic overview of the safe house so that they understand you know the work that we're doing on the other side um but also then it's it's more about operations and safety and you know those kinds of things for you know for a thrift shop volunteer that makes sense it's great how about you sarah yes so Training is one of the things that I'm most passionate about that we do at MOXA. We follow the same lengthy standards as every other SB and DV organization. Um, I think something that is unique about ours is that all new staff, interns, and volunteers have to go through the exact same training. So we really lay a foundation for everybody um, of shared knowledge. So uh, one of the things that we do is that we have everybody be trained in the basics of hospital advocacy, because that's really one of the main gateways for people to our services. It's the number one need of our volunteer program. And the skills you learn from hospital advocacy translate to every other position that we have for our volunteers. So our uh, training is actually split, half online at your own pace, and then the other half during a weekend together. And the online content is kind of ever evolving. We try to reassess quarterly what the new resources are out there, making sure that it's pertinent and applicable. Um, so right now, the online training is split between kind of three main focuses. We have articles and videos that kind of lay the foundation of the understanding of rape culture, uh, systematic oppression, the impact of trauma on survivors in the community. So that includes things like the neurobiology of trauma um, and Kansas and Missouri Coalition Sexual Violence Statistics, so people understand the world that they're approaching. And then we also have online training modules through the Victim Assistance Training, um, and those give us certificates of completion that help us track people in the training process, and that dives deeper on core competencies and special considerations like how to um, you know, provide the best services to survivors with mental health issues. And then lastly, as a part of that online training component, we have MOXA made training videos. Those are going step by step through hospital advocacy, our rules and regulations. And we think that that's a great way for people to learn those components so that they have the ability to go and rewatch. They target very specific questions. They're, you know, divided into different sections. So it's really helpful. 
uh, we find that our weekend training and the component of online training matches a lot of different people's learning styles, which is great. And then our weekend training, it's like almost like advocacy boot camp, as I like to think of it. Um, and it's really a space for us to dive deeper together. So it's staff, interns, volunteers, and we um, go through questions, concerns. We also do a lot of group work. We do scenarios and role plays together. And then we go and we tour St. Luke's and we do go and talk to their forensic examiner, exam, examination nurses. Um, and we see the kits and we really go so in depth. We want everyone to be empowered at the end of weekend training to go and do hospital advocacy. And at our last training, uh, we had somebody actually sign up to do hospital advocacy the very same week that they were trained. So we know that it's effective. Um, people feel good and empowered to do so. We do offer uh, shadowing opportunities for people like they need further knowledge. And then for our crisis line and our education programming, we have subsequent trainings that people can opt in to take and learn more and go and do those programs. Awesome. Yeah. I love hearing about both of the different like ways you all bring together different pieces. And Jessica did a great job plugging some of our stuff. So for those of you who aren't aware, if you're looking for supplemental material for training, we do for, this is for members only. Um, we have Advocates Academy. So it's a huge 48 hour e-course that people can take. So that is available on our website, um, on Coalition Manager. Connect with us if you are interested in getting your volunteers plugged into that. So that's a great place to start. If you're getting your volunteer program off the ground, you're looking for more ways to supplement your stuff outside of, you know, your program specific needs. We also have tons of free courses online for anyone. So if you're looking for programming, you're like, I don't, I'm kind of wanting to volunteer, but I'm not really familiar with what I'm going to be doing, what the training looks like. We have videos on YouTube and on our education page on our website, where you can check out some of the training videos that are free for anyone to use. So check those out. Um, and thanks Jessica for mentioning that doing my job for me. I love it. Um, but I'm really curious about kind of talked about the different pieces you, you bring into that. It sounds like you have really specific times you have to do this. So is that the case? Like, do you have them only a few times a year? And if that's the case, how do you connect volunteers uh, and keep them engaged between the time, the point where they're talking to you and the point where they can start this training? That's a great question. We offer our trainings quarterly. So, and that seems to be a pretty good flow. I will say that it is tough for people that apply like a week after we've done a training and they do have a little bit of time to wait, but generally the time that it takes to do the online training program really digest that information um, as well as do our necessary requirements for background checks, fingerprinting, all of that good stuff. Generally two months is a good period for people to do all of that. And by the time they're ready, the weekend training rolls around. So that is what we currently do. And then maybe hopefully in the future, if we see a large uptick in our volunteer program, we can expand that to more trainings per year. Fantastic. Awesome. How about you, Jessica? Um, for us, we tend to do two trainings a year. We do have, as I mentioned at the beginning, a smaller cadre of volunteers who help with direct clients. So we tend to schedule them at the beginning of the fall and spring semester. Um, which makes sense for our college students. But then also, um, if we have other volunteers, you know, adult volunteers, they also are welcome to join us at those times. And so that that has worked for us. And then for our other volunteers, because they're not client facing, it's most of that training is one on one um, as we have new volunteers join us. And and because it's, it, you know, at that point, it's it's a few hours as opposed to, you know, a week. And so we have uh, so we're able to do that, you know, in, in, in an individualized way. Awesome. Jessica, do you have any folks who maybe they're interested in doing crisis line volunteer, but they start out maybe in the store or something, so they have an opportunity to get connected right away? No, you know, there's very little crossover, actually. Interesting. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the folks who are volunteers in our thrift store um, are there because they love that environment. And, you know, they just, they're all, as I mentioned, almost all shoppers themselves, and they have formed a family amongst themselves of, uh, you know, support one another and go to lunch together and, you know, do things outside of the thrift store, which is really cool to see that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's their focus. And as I mentioned, we, we really want them to know about the work that we do at the safe house and be able to talk about it when they say I volunteer at the safe house thrift store that they can also talk about the other work that we do for clients and survivors of domestic violence, but we have not had a lot of crossover between the two. Um, 
<clears throat> and so, yeah, we're just happy to have to have many vol specialized volunteers in these different areas. Absolutely. Um, you kind of talked about this a little bit, and then both of you mentioned different things in this arena, but I'm curious about what kind of volunteer engagement looks like for you. It sounds like both of you have different aspects of your programs that, or whether this was created organically by the volunteers that really helped them feel connected to MOXA or to Safe House. So can you maybe expand a little bit more on what your engagement looks like for your volunteers and how you try to keep fostering that environment? Do you want to go first, Jessica, because I see you sure. on my screen. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think that um, it's a unique uh, opportunity and challenge for volunteers because you there's obviously you do not have the compensation aspect as a way to um, to thank people for their great work and the time that they give and that kind of thing. And so you've got to come up with other things. And so for us, um, we have uh, we always every year we have a volunteer appreciation banquet. And we have it at a little local restaurant. We move around town, so it's new and different every time. And um, that's an opportunity for myself and um, president of our board comes. And then, of course, our thrift store manager. And we all are able to take a moment and thank our volunteers for um, the great work that they do and, and the time that they give to us and, and actually making the operation of our, of our thrift store possible. Um, and then for our fundraising volunteers at Vintage Now, um, we also have several opportunities. Um, there's a there's a, a meet and greet event that actually happens a couple of months before the event itself, where we're able to say thank you to all of our volunteers. And then um, for all of our volunteers, both fundraising and shelter based and thrift store, we have a luncheon um, in August of every year. It's not a fundraiser. Uh, it's, it's a friend raiser, as they say, but uh, the, we we just say thank you to to a lot of different people, including our volunteers, and we recognize um, all those different groups and and uh, and give them free tickets and really um, appreciate the work that they do um, at that event as well, and kind of bring that to the community's notice. Then at that time, um, because there's lots of other folks who support us and are involved with our, with our work, and they get to see you know the volunteers that we have that do such great things. So that's fantastic. It's amazing. How about you, Sarah? Yes, uh, I'm excited to talk about this. Engagement is my very favorite part of my job. And I have a lot of favorite parts of my job. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think the volunteers that we have do such phenomenal work. It really takes special people to be able to do this, this level of advocacy. Um, and so for me, I really want to be a champion and a steward of them and their time. So we do uh, quite a bit in terms of cultivating that those connections and building community like I talked about before and helping people feel less alone when they're volunteering. So in addition to the staff on call support system that we have, um, we also have a volunteer Facebook group, we've got a monthly newsletter, we send cards, we do calls, we check in. Um, but on a deeper level than that, we also have a lot of ways for our volunteers to tell us what they think and we take their opinions and advice mm -hmm. and we move it into change within our program. So we've got feedback surveys, we've got anonymous reporting, we have multiple people for them to get in touch with if they have questions or concerns. And then one of the most fun things is that we do a lot of events per year. So we have um, Volunteer Appreciation Week, obviously in April, very exciting. We'll do a yoga night with our volunteers. We're gonna do a game night. It's gonna be great. We're gonna do a virtual self-care competition. Uh, so people have a way to participate from home. We also do uh, outside of Volunteer Appreciation Week events all through the year. So in the summer, which is our really busy active time, we try to do an event every single month so people can have a time to come together and debrief and breathe from what they're doing. So we'll either, you know, meet up at a restaurant or we'll have um, some sort of, you know, activity all together. And then in December, we have my favorite event of the year, Volunteer. You're welcome to steal that name. Any other volunteer coordinators listening? And it is our volunteer holiday party. Um, and then in addition to that, we also do quarterly volunteer meetings, both in person and virtual. So people are always aware of changes, updates things that are coming up, ways for them to get involved. We've also been able to expand the things that volunteers have been able to be involved in at MOXA. So they're now able to be in a part of like the SAM committee that we do internally so that they can help us with those sorts of events. Um, 
we also do have the ability, and this is a, a really fantastic thing that we're able to offer for folks that are spending time on the crisis line, um, we are able to give nominal stipends to our volunteers, which that just really thanks them for the hard work that they're doing. Um, and I think one of the other things is that the impact of the work itself is a lot of the reason that people keep on coming back. You know, aside from all the things that we do, survivors might not remember the names of the volunteers that are in the rooms with them, but they will remember that somebody is there. So I think that there's a level of fulfillment through these positions that is really rare to find in our day-to-day -day lives, much less in a volunteer role. So we're thankful for all of that. Um, and a last little exciting volunteer appreciation thing, we actually just had one of our volunteers, Alyssa Keener, who's a crisis line volunteer. Uh, she was awarded a national daily points of light day in her honor. So that is a really big big deal. And we're excited to be able to recognize our volunteers on that level. That's fantastic. Um, I'm not familiar with that. What is Daily Points of Light? Yes. So Daily Points of Light is a national and international uh, organization that honors volunteers. They're also kind of the stewards of National Volunteer Week. Okay. So every single day they honor somebody that's out there in the community doing really incredible work. And for Alyssa in particular, she donated 1,677 hours last year. So we, she definitely has earned that award. Um, but all of our volunteers, whether they put in five hours or 10,000 hours, every single one of them matters. So I think that's the other thing is just meeting people where they are and supporting people on an individual basis. Yeah, no, that's phenomenal. That's a lot of hours. So hats off to Alyssa, but also all the volunteers, because like you said, any, any amount of hours um, can make a significant difference for programs and for survivors. So anyone who's listening, who's curious about volunteering, get plugged into your local program. If you're not sure where that is, um, you can go on our website. We have a public directory for all of our member programs across the state. So you can find programs in your local area in Missouri. I do want to ask y'all about self-care volunteer. So I've heard you mention a few times, but I'm curious, both of you, um, what does self-care look like when you're trying to promote that with volunteers, especially those who maybe don't have like a background in social services where they're learning about that stuff in their programming. Um, and so they're, it's kind of their first foray into this type of work. How do you help them balance those things and not get burnt out as much as you can possibly avoid that, right? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's not, it's not something that even, I'm not even sure 10 years ago we were really talking about. And so, you know, we've been working to not only incorporate it with our employees, with our staff, um, but also with our clients and then, and with our volunteers. So, you know, basically every area um, of our operation, we know that this is a, an important component of what we do. And so um, I thought that Sarah just gave, I'm just so impressed with her entire volunteer program <laughs> and uh, what she was talking about, uh, um, the multiple opportunities for whether it's debriefing or, or just getting together and, um, <clears throat> you know, those opportunities to to be reminded that that we do we really care about you we also appreciate you um we in no way do we want to overwhelm you but we know this work can be overwhelming and so um i think flexibility is a key to that and so letting people um sort of set their own pace um not only with how they get started but also how they you know on a day-to-day week-to-week basis how they um set their time and and what works best for them um and i do think that being around um around our staff is helpful because um, some of us do have more training in that in those kinds of things and we can both check in with our volunteers because we do work so closely with them but then also they know that they're that we're available you know if they need to reach out as well makes yeah. sense all of that in terms of flexibility exactly what Jessica said the ability to set your own schedule if you're going to do something for free you better have as much power to do it as possible is what I think. So the ability to say, I can't volunteer for a month and then know that there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, take the time and the space that you need. Do what you can when you can is my motto for volunteers. So I think that that's really important in building the foundation of flexibility and knowing that there's a lot of forgiveness and just gratitude <laughs> from our staff. Um, 
So I think also we have self-care built in from our training. So we have it as a part of our online training portion is building their own self-care plan. We've got a little website that's all about self-care for volunteers. And then we also do a self-care portion in our training. And in our newsletter, we'll have a little self-care corner with tips and tricks. Um, but I think it's it's more than that. Like we know, self-care is more than bubble baths and chocolate. It's how do we make this work sustainable for ourselves? So something that I think is really great about the work that I'm able to do is that I also do hospital advocacy and crisis line. I'm on the crisis line later this afternoon. Uh, and so are all of my associates that work with volunteers. So we are able to be able to really know some of the anxiety, some of the concerns, some of the weird situations that they might get into as volunteers and be able to really empathize with them and help them through those things. So I think as many barriers as we can break down for volunteering is important, um, but self-care is just an ongoing thing. And it's something that the staff working with volunteers have to have as well. So maintaining ourselves, helping them support themselves, it's all a big cycle. One other thing I wanted to add that occurred to me as, as Sarah was sharing is that for some of our volunteers, their volunteer work is self-care, mm. and so, which I think is awesome. And so especially like I think about our thrift store volunteers, you know, this is for a lot of them, this is social time and, and you know, the work, there, there's, there's work to do, but it's, it's not the draining mental load kind of work. And so they just enjoy it. And um, so that's really neat to see because, you know, they're like, they look forward to coming in and this is a great, you know, this is a great time for them. And that's awesome. And I think, you know, for our, um, for our fundraising volunteers with Vintage Now, most of them work professionally and give of their, of their time um, to help us with Vintage Now. And they kind of see it in the same way, you know, they're part of this group and, you know, it's a neat group of people uh, who all have this shared vision. And for them, it's energizing to be able to come and do this work. And we appreciate them so much but we're also happy to offer, you know, an opportunity that can be kind of revitalizing in that way. That's fantastic. I, I love that you drew that connection of like, it has different experiences for different volunteers and this volunteerism really could be that self-care for them from other parts of their life or whatever that might look like, whether it's their career, their, what their retirement is like. That's, I love that um, framework too. That's fantastic. We might have touched on this a little bit too, but I wanted to kind of draw back to that because probably a lot of folks who might be listening or watching are thinking, okay, we get volunteers, we train them. How do we keep them? I know you all mentioned a lot of times that folks, once they kind of get in, they want to stay, but I'd love to hear more about um, what that looks like for you all or how have you ever worked with a volunteer who is maybe kind of, you notice they may be drifting and how you tried to bring that back, them back in in a way that um, made them feel more engaged once again with this work. Who wants to go? Yeah. Um, I'll start. So when I came in as the volunteer coordinator, my first goal was to offer up the ability for anybody to meet with me. They could schedule a 30 minute Teams meeting, Zoom call, phone call in person to just talk about where they were at as a volunteer and give me honest feedback about the program itself. And I've really kept that open door policy since then. So I think that one of the things that volunteers know is that they can tell the truth about what's going on with them and that they can also take breaks and it doesn't mean anything. They can stop if they need to and come back. We know that this is really personal work and that also there's a lot of other things going on in the world in addition to volunteering. So people are still welcome to come to events. They're still welcome to be on the Facebook group, even if they haven't been very active. Um, and we also like to reach back out to people as often as we can and just do check-ins. But truly, I think the biggest key to retention is to just treat people with respect and let them be you know, in charge of their own decisions. And if volunteering works for them in their own life, that's fantastic. And we will empower them with as many tools as we can to make it easy for them. But if it's not, we also want to respect that decision. So that's kind of where I stand on retention um, is just utilizing all of the different things in our pocket as an organization to make them feel valued and to know the impact of their work. It's really significant to know how many runs volunteers took last year 
I'm going to mess it up if I don't pull it up. 242 hospital activations were taken by volunteers. That's if, if staff were the ones that would have to cover that, it's not possible that all survivors would have had somebody with them. And then in addition to that, 11,904 hours last year, like that's not just an empty number to us. That's the amount of people that we were able to, to help that time. So I think that retention is kind of ever, ever green, ever evolving and changing. Um, but I think a lot of it is understanding the evolving system of volunteerism, how global trends are going for volunteers. Um, and right now the trends of volunteerism are moving much towards individual individualism, self-directed learning and accessibility. And I think those are things that we're able to offer in our program. It's fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. How about you, Jessica? Well, I had to look, I had to look it up. So 5,808 hours is what we had in volunteer um, service. Isn't that, this, those numbers are just remarkable, I think, for both Seriously. of us. And I know, at least in our case, that's our 22 number, and we expect it to be higher in 2023 because we have had even more volunteers, you know, come back and engage with us. But I think that, um, uh, you, you know, employee retention and volunteer retention sometimes are very similar. And so just like Sarah said, the ability to communicate um, and to um, show your appreciation um, for the great work that they do and to make the, the work environment um, or the volunteer environment, you know, sometimes the, those situations are extremely difficult, but we, we do our best to make it an environment where people feel, um, you know, that they can make an impact. And, and yes, they do look forward to coming um, and, and feel like that they're making a difference because they really, really are, you know, without a doubt, our agencies would not be the same without our volunteers. And yeah, one of the things that we're always, you know, hot off the presses with our annual report and into the hands of the volunteers so that they know, you know, the work that you're doing really, really matters to the scope of the entire agency. And in the end, you know, we're all here because we want to help save lives and keep people safe. And, um, you know, I tell not only our volunteers, but, you know, our, our donors and, and our, our agency partners and everybody, you know, when you when you give your of your time or or other resources to the safe house, you are doing by extension this work. And we could not do it without you. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, our, our thrift store and outreach office, which is where my office here, we're, we're connected by a, do by a back door. And so, you know, at least, I, unfortunately, I don't get over there every day, but, you know, two or three times a week, I circle through and, hey, how is everybody doing? Great to see you today. And, and if, you know, if people have things they want to talk about or whatever they can. And, and of course, you know, thrift, there's uh, thrift store managers there every day with them. And, and she's wonderful about doing all that as well. And, um, and in the case of, of our other volunteers, you know, we just take every opportunity to try to tell them, you know, we couldn't do it without you. And, and we, we don't take it for granted. Fantastic. There's so much more we could talk about on this topic. Um, but we're getting near to one o'clock. I wanted to just ask one more question of you all. And it's, Maybe folks listening are thinking about how they can rebuild their programs, how they could start a volunteer program, or how they can maybe revamp their current one. Um, and do you have any tips or things that you would want to share to those folks who might be listening? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, okay. So this is, I'm, I'm an absolute geek about volunteer administration. It is my absolute love. I highly, highly recommend the CVA. So the, the Council for Volunteer Administration, they are a plethora of resources. Um, honestly, there's a lot online for beginning your practices. Energize um, also is a great resource. There's a lot. But I also think you can be a volunteer manager and have no experience. As long as you're able to, you know, meet people where they're at and leverage the needs of the people to the needs of your agency, that's the basis of volunteer management. Um, I also love to talk to other volunteer coordinators. It's one of my very favorite things. So I would open myself up as a resource for anybody that is looking to have deeper conversations or wants to know more about the work that we're doing at MOXA specifically. Fantastic, thank you, Sarah. And I will get those links from you and we'll make sure to put those in the show notes on the podcast and on YouTube and also in the comments on Facebook. Jessica, what about you? 
I would just say, you know, it's okay to start small with your volunteer program and, and just build a quality program with a few people mm-hmm. and then, you know, and then let it grow from there. But there's, that's just fine. And you, and you, you know, a small group of people can also make a big impact. And so, you know, you don't have to have 50 or 60 or a hundred volunteers right off the bat. And the other thing is, um, use your volunteers to recruit other volunteers. That is a fantastic way because they know exactly what it's like and why they do it. And when we ask them to share, that's extremely impactful to other people. And we have had definitely seen that happen uh, in every area of our volunteer work where people are like, the, I love this. And so I got my friend or my sister or my coworker or whatever to come and do it too, because it's so great. And so definitely tap into your own volunteer base, I think, to help build your program. And the other thing is, don't forget to run your background checks on your volunteers. So yes, yes. <laughs> yes that can be very important. Um, and that's always another one of the challenges. But like Sarah mentioned, um, you can reach out to anyone, um, including the coalition, if you have questions about this. Jessica mentioned our base camp. If you are a member, this is a great place to just connect with other folks like Sarah, like Jessica, who do volunteer programs. So if you're a member or you're thinking about becoming a member, uh, reach out to us. We're happy to help you get set up with those things if you're not already on there. Um, and also for more plugs, you can also use any of our other resources like those training resources, like those things in your volunteer programs as well. So definitely keep those in mind um, and we're happy to help anytime. So just want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Sarah. It was great to have both of you on. Um, this live event was recorded and will be uploaded to our channel on YouTube and as well as to our podcast platforms. So currently we have Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. But if there is a platform that you love listening to things on, but we don't have it, please let me know. Uh, we can try to expand out to other podcast platforms as well. There's just a lot more than I realized. So we decided to, try to start with some of those main ones and we can always expand those out. All of our previous episodes are currently uploaded on YouTube and on our podcast platforms. So next month's event will take place the last Friday of April. And I want to let you all know that we'll be getting a new host. So I'm actually leaving the Missouri Coalition, which is very bittersweet for me. I'm not going too far, though, because I'm going to still be in the sexual violence space. But there will be a new host. We're not sure who it's going to be yet. But keep an eye out for that person. They will also continue the Momentum Live um, effort. So we're not going away. Just a new face. But thank you both for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for watching. It's great to see all of you again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Megan. Best wishes.